And so there's a focus not just on, on, on learning, but also on behavior, right? Uh, secularism is focused on things in this world, so how about how to act, what to do? Um, so we have books like Castiglione's Book of the Courtier. And the Book of the Courtier suggests, you know, how one should behave. A book of manners. Right? Or Machiavelli's The Prince, which is a manual for how to govern. Right? And, and, and these are both good examples of secularism. Right? They're, they're suggesting how one should behave in this world. And they're not focusing on biblical teachings and Christian theology. But they're, they're looking at culture and, and basically surmising what the ideal man is uh, in this world. How he should behave. For Machiavelli, it's especially easy to note the secular nature of his work because he rejects Christian morality as applying uh, to the decision-making process of leaders. He basically says leaders have a bigger responsibility to become as powerful as possible to defend their people and therefore subterfuge or, you know, maybe bad things might occasionally be necessary. Okay. Northern Renaissance is similar in that there's looking back to ancient sources, including the ancient Greeks and Romans, but the Northern Renaissance thinkers are often more focused on Christianity and reinterpreting Christianity and bringing that Renaissance humanistic focus on the individual to Christianity and saying that the individual Christian needs to understand Christianity needs to understand and look back to the writings of the ancient thinkers, the church fathers, and the early Christians. Erasmus, for example, retranslates the Bible, looking at these ancient sources. And they say that the individual needs to develop, you know, a greater piousness, a greater individual uh, worship. Erasmus writes about the need for individuals to understand the philosophy of Christ. Um, and instead of needing to go through rituals and having other people praying for you and the church as an organization doing things uh, that will get people into heaven, Erasmus says that individuals need to seek out the knowledge of Jesus, of Christ. Right? They need to learn his philosophy so that they can live it. Now these uh, thinkers are all Catholics, but they're calling for a new way to, or a reformed way, a gradual reform of the way the Catholics practice. Now, it's easy then to connect the dots between the Renaissance and the Reformation. The Renaissance is focused on new ways of looking at the world, and the Renaissance also has a, an emphasis on individuals thinking and seeking and accomplishing things. So the Reformation is a reflection of those things. Individuals reading, researching, seeking knowledge, looking back to ancient sources, and therefore questioning the established church and many of its practices. Can it be said that the Renaissance causes the Reformation? No. But does the Renaissance have an effect on how the Reformation plays out? Almost certainly. Now, there are other reasons for the cause of the Reformation. Obviously, perceptions of corruptions and the need for reform within the church. But this individualism of the Renaissance, this idea that the individual can seek knowledge for himself, ultimately plays a large role in Lutheran and Protestant uh, theology. They reject the idea that a church, whether it's an individual in the form of the Pope or even a church council, has final authority over truth. They emphasize the ability of the individual to read the Bible and learn and through his conscience understand Christian truth. And so the, these humanistic ideas about uh, individual and learning the individual and, and learning and seeking and looking back um, to ancient sources uh, certainly has a big influence on the Reformation. 
The scientific revolution also is obviously impacted by the thoughts of the, of the uh, Renaissance. And in fact, some of those early experiments with human dissection are being done by Renaissance artists and other Renaissance doctors. Uh, you know, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci both sort of famously involved in, uh, you know, dissection to understand human anatomy. And so, it's not just that science, as we know, it be, sort of begins uh, in, during the Renaissance, but it's also that way of thinking, the way of challenging old things, and looking back and thinking for oneself, and that secular outlook, looking at the world as it is, not as it should be, or not with uh, you know, uh, notions that uh, there is a God that's interfering in it, but looking at it as it is. And so the discoveries that happen in physics and astronomy are, that happen beginning with Copernicus, who it's in the 16th century, so amidst the Protestant Revolution, or Protestant Reformation, we have the scientific revolution beginning. They're happening concurrently. Scientific revolution is not quick. It's very gradual. Over a century uh, separates Copernicus from Newton. But, so is it a revolution at all? Well, in terms of its speed, certainly not. But in terms of how it changes human worldview, yes. So what is the result of the scientific revolution? Well, just a new way of looking at the world. The scientific revolution, like Protestant Reformation, empowers the individual to look at the world, to question things in the world, and using, in his, using his mind to understand how things operate in the world. With Kepler's laws of planetary motion, explaining how these planets move using a simple mathematical formula, both Galileo and Newton are similarly using math and developing new techniques in math in order to understand motion. New, uh, Newton, for example, develops calculus. So in other words, human beings are developing a new language, a new way of understanding things in order to make sense of the world outside of their minds. And so they have to develop math in order to be able to make these observations about motion. And the result is, now that we have this mathematical uh, understanding, we can measure and understand how things will operate. And the result is, is that the universe suddenly looks very straightforward, very mechanistic, like a machine. There's this mechanistic worldview, or this world machine, that Newton's ideas uh, help bring about. In Newton's conception, the world is operating along these principles and nothing's interfering with them. And so we see the origins of deism uh, in the me mechanistic uh, universe that Newton uh, surmises. Deism is, of course, that sort of religious view that God created the universe like a clockwork or creates a clock. He sets it in motion and now the universe is ticking along these mathematical principles that human beings have been able to discern. 